Uh, so the first thing I want to do is uh, I want to wish everyone a happy new year. Um, yesterday I didn't stay until the change of the new year because the music was a bit too loud for my taste. But uh, I hope you've all enjoyed yourself and you all had a good sleep to now be fully awake for my lecture. Um, now the first, there were some questions and uh, the questions which I got are such that you know, I sometimes wonder whether the things I'm going to, uh, I'm telling you are too elementary or too advanced. And the questions are such that you, you can get, can draw both conclusions. Uh, but one thing I certainly didn't want to uh, stick in your mind is that the question of constructing supersymmetric series is simply a matter of putting together bosons and fermions in such a way that uh, uh, both the, the number of degrees fermion, bosonic and fermionic degrees match, but there's of course more to it. And um, if this had been, you know, a regular introduction to supersymmetry and supergravity, I would have started out with a representation theory of uh, superalgebras. Analogy, what you do in quantum field theory when you classify the particle multiplets, which are unitary, irreducible representations of Poincaré group, and uh, uh, well, that was a st step I skipped, and I assume that many of you, especially those who work on, uh, you know, have seen low energy supersymmetric models, are probably very familiar with. But um, I just wanted to give you a sketch of how this uh, works in 11 dimensions, because this is something that's not quite in the textbooks. How do you do representation theory of uh, super algebras in 11 dimensions, not just in four? And uh, and in this way, it will emerge immediately that there must be a three-form field, because there was one of the questions for 11-dimensional supergravity, why not just take 84 scalars or some other combination? Uh, it must be a three-form field. Actually, this argument is not in Kremer julia Scherk, but uh, it's nevertheless true. And you will see it's very simple, because it simply reduces to the representations here if uh, Clifford algebras. So, now this, this should be familiar to many of you. The way you, you do this, you simply write down the superalgebra. So you have supercharges, Q alpha, Q beta. And because we are in 11 dimensions, as I said, these are real 32 component spinners. So 1 to 32. And uh, then it's just the usual superalgebra. I have to throw in a charge conjugation matrix, of course, but that's a technical detail. Uh, in four dimensions, you maybe sometimes you do it with Q dagger, and then it's P slash on the right-hand side, and you use the Majorana property and Pn. Okay? So in this form, it's true actually in every dimension, and you put in the charge conjugation matrix, because this is symmetric, it's an anti-commutator, also has to be symmetric in under interchange of these two indices. And then you uh, distinguish two cases, namely massive, just like you do in uh, the representations here of the Poincaré group, in which case p squared is equal to m squared. And then you choose a frame. You just go to the rest frame, which is like m, and then lots of zeros. And then you decompose your your charges into creation and annihilation operators, and this way you build multiplets. And if it's massless, uh, oh, sorry, yes, yes. Well, um, massless. In this case, you have p squared equal zero. In this case, of course, there's no rest frame. And then what you do is you go to a frame where Pm is equal to P, where P is just some positive number. Uh, and then 0, 0. And then the last component, the 10th or 11th component in our case, is also equal to P. OK, so this is also the, the distinction you make in ordinary quantum field theory. And you also make it when you look at uh, supermultiplets. Now, as it turns out, in 11 dimensions, the massive multiplets are not of interest, but they could be analyzed in exactly the same fashion. Um, and the reason they're not of interest, or were thought not to be of interest, 
when this theory was constructed was when you reduce 11 dimensions to 4 dimensions and decompose this into 4 dimensional multiplets you will find that you go beyond spin 2. Now massless multiplets you have this and the important thing that happens is that in this case unlike in this case this matrix is degenerate it has zero eigenvalues and uh, what happens effectively is that the number of supercharges reduced by one, a factor of one half. So, so that's one half of the, the way you do it technically is that one half of these supercharges generate zero norm states and those you discard. So effectively half number of supercharges. And this of course happens in any dimension, it also happens in 11. So then when you go to this frame you have to, of course you have to choose some basis, appropriate basis, but at the end of the day in the massless case, so m squared equals zero, uh, the analysis reduces to q alpha prime, q beta prime, equal to 2p delta alpha prime beta prime. And now because of this halving, uh, the index alpha indices just run over from to 60. So this is now the, the, the representation theory of the super algebra is the representation theory of this algebra. And you can easily recognize what this is. This is just the Clifford algebra. Well, absorbing, uh, choosing appropriate normalizations. This is just the Clifford algebra, Clifford algebra over 16 generators. So in 16 uh, generators, and because it's delta alpha beta, it's a Euclidean uh, Clifford algebra. And then now you take simply the, the, uh, the paper I mentioned in my first lecture, for example, this paper by Kokoro, and then it's, you, you read from this that this is just the algebra of uh, 256 by 256 matrices over the reals. Okay. Now if this were SO16, we know what this is because this is just, uh, we know the spinner representations of SO16. So we know that this 256 splits into chiral spinners. Okay, so this is right-handed, left-handed spinner because there's a gamma 5 matrix which you get by multiplying all the uh, gamma matrices. And uh, so this would be like uh, a representation theory for SO16. Uh, the, only, the only subtlety here is that this is a spinner index and supposed to be spinner index with respect to SO9. SO9 is the little group, in this case the little group is SO9. Whereas in this case, it, in the massive case, it would be equal to SO10. So what we have to do in order to sort of bring this back to 11-dimensional supergravity, we have to identify the 16V of SO16, um, which is this Clifford algebra, with the 16-dimensional spinner representation of SO9. Just so happens that in this number of dimensions in SO9, the irreducible representation of the Clifford algebra is a 16 component spinner, and you simply identify this. And then th this simply means that we have to decompose this into, so we have to decompose the SO16 representation according to uh, SO9 with this identification. And if you do this, then it just turns out to be 44 plus 84 from this plus 128. And this is such that indeed these are just the representations that I showed you yesterday. So this is the three-form representation and this is the vector spinner of SO9. 
Okay, so we've recovered uh, what I told you yesterday, but now out of this representation theory, it comes out uniquely, and this tells you that this is the choice you have to make, and this is the identification, and the field content that you have to couple to get the theory in 11 dimensions. So in fact, as you can see, uh, this would even work in higher dimensions. You could also, uh, you know, if you want to do super, uh, uh, analyze super symmetry algebras in 17 dimensions, you simply, you know, you work out with a Majorana spinner, uh, for example, and then you make exactly the same kind of argument, and it always reduces to, um, to the Clifford algebra. This is a bit different from the way you learn it in textbook for n equals 1, although it's really the same thing, because in, in n equals 1 and 4 dimensions, you just, in the massless case, you just have one, you have two, two spinner components, and if you go to the massless case, one of them becomes ineffective, and then you just have one charge, Q, and it's adjoint Q dagger. And this is the way you build multiplets, but here it works a little differently, but this is the general general um, uh, structure behind this. So and as you can see, as you now go up in, as you, if you were to go up in dimension, then because this, uh, this grows like uh, the, the number of the dimension of the Clifford algebra grows uh, like roughly 2 to the n over 2, where n is the dimension, you see that these multiples become very large. So in this case, you would already have to deal with, with uh, the Clifford algebra of um, 32, over 32 generators, and that's much, much larger. So somehow you see the problem. One way to see that you cannot, well, it's sort of hand-waving uh, argument to see that uh, you cannot, it will be, would be difficult to uh, construct supersymmetric theories beyond, is that the spinner, the number of spinner components grows uh, like an exponent, whereas number of vector and tensor components only grows polynomially. So, to repeat, uh, you have to go through this kind of analysis, and this is actually also what you do in four dimensions when you build supersymmetric series. You first construct the irreducible representation, supermultiplet. So, in four dimensions, you have the Vestumino multiplet, you have the vector multiplet. And you have the supergravity multiplet, and then you, once you have these building blocks, you build together the series uh, which are supersymmetric. Okay. So I think. Is there any question? Yes. Yeah, so so when, <coughs> when we do a four dimension in Poincare, we start with two uh, Casimirs, uh, and this word also Pauli Lubanski. What is the analog here? In oh, the Pauli Lubanski vector in. Ah, good but question. There are several more yeah, yeah. In, well, in four dimensions, uh, yes. Actually, I have, I have to think about that. Yes. But it's true that in, in four dimensions, you have also super Casimir to, ca to characterize. You, you don't make any use of it in 10 dimensions? No. Well, I haven't made use of it here. So. Well, you use the. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh, let me think about it because. Uh, I mean, the, the, the way this theory was constructed was not by first doing the super multiplet analysis because people expected there to be only one theory anyway, and then uh, uh, this, this is what it is. Okay, so now once we have the multiplet, now this next question is how to construct the appropriate uh, theory. And in order to save time, yes? What? Oh, oh, that by this I mean in, in SO16 has a vector representation. That's just the usual uh, vector representation. And it also has spinner representations, left and right handed. They have 128 components. But if you go back to SO9, SO9 um, the spinner, the vector would be nine components and the spinner would be 16. And this is, yeah, this is our, okay. So anyway, once it was clear that this, this was the multiplet, you just had to go ahead and uh, construct the theory. So I've, I've already, in order to save time, I've, uh, I've written these things on the, on the blackboard. And um, so 
So this was, this was what uh, was obtained by Kremer Julia Scherk in 1978. Um, are following this observation by Werner Nahm that before, that this was the maximum number of dimensions that would not give higher spin than two upon reduction to four dimensions. And then uh, this is it, basically. So let me write, make a line here. Uh, so I've already explained in my last lecture some of the building blocks that go into this and some things that you can write down immediately. So basically how this works is that you simply write down all possible invariants, you put coefficients, you also make an ansatz for the supersymmetry variations. Of course, that's inspired by what had been obtained previously in supergravity theories. And then you simply try to make it, first of all, uh, supersymmetric. And secondly, another thing you have to check, I mean, just having an uh, transformation rules and an invariant Lagrangian is not enough. You also have to show that the, the algebra of supersymmetry transformations closes. When you take the commutator of two tr such transformations, you should again get a combination of the symmetry transformations that characterize the theory. Okay, so I said uh, I've, I've introduced the field bind formalism where you have the spin connection. Um, you, you take these contractions in order to form the Ricci scalar. The E is the metric determinant, the square root of the metric determinant, which is just the determinant of the field bind. So that part is clear. Uh, that part, uh, I also motivated. It's, it, it was uh, sort of directly derived from the rarita schwinger action, which was, which was obtained just in flat space and no coupling to gravity. But that's also easy to see how to generalize to gravity. We uh, replace the ordinary derivative by Lorentz covariant derivative here. Uh, these are world indices, and therefore here we have to put the gamma matrices with curved indices, which is obtained from the usual Clifford algebra by multiplying with the appropriate number of uh, field binary. And as I said yesterday, uh, there's also a question here whether you put the fully covariant derivative, which also has the gamma, the, the affine connection on this, but uh, it doesn't make much difference because here what appears here is only the anti-symmetric part of the affine connection, and that's a tensor, which will turn out to be not to be zero, that's the torsion. Uh, but because it's a tensor, it doesn't really make such, such a big difference, and has become customary in supergravity. You just put the Lorentz covariant derivative here, and the other terms you somehow uh, list separately. So that much is also clear. Um, then we have a kinetic term for the three-form field, where this, uh, where this is just the usual field strength. So I, I don't think I have to write this. So, the, well, let me write it anyway. So this is defined to be d m a n p q. It's just the exterior derivative uh, of the three-form field. Uh, the only thing you can debate endlessly about is whether you put here four, four factorial or four. That's a matter of taste. As I said, I'm not using the conventions, not quite of this original paper, but of the paper that was Thibault and Axel Kleinschmidt, which I referred to in my first lecture. Okay, so much is clear. Now, here you also have this funny term here. I didn't write out all the indices. I will have lots more indices than Slava, but... Uh, uh, sometimes, <laughs> with, if it's too much, it's too much, so I just put dots. Um, so that you have an 11, because you're in 11 dimensions, you can write this, uh, this combination. It's a Chan Simons like term of combination of four. You have these four form field strengths twice, and then the bare A field. And as you know, it's, uh, it's invariant up to gauge invariant up to total derivatives. By the way, when we talk about Invariant Lagrangians, I always mean modulo total derivatives. Those you can always throw away. Uh, what is perhaps important here is that uh, this is the tensor, which you get from the flat epsilon symbol by raising or turning all indices into curved indices. But it's also multiplied by E, 
And uh, in fact, this epsilon is just the inverse determinant. And this means the thing that th this combination, which appears here, is actually independent of the, uh, of the field bind. Although it looks like it depends on it, but it's actually, it's just a number. So when you vary to the variation here, uh, you don't have to vary this, this factor. Well, then you have a kind of a Pauli type coupling um, between these four form field strengths. There's no bare coupling of this to the fermions. And then you have a certain combination here. Uh, uh, again, as I said, you make this kind of ansatz and then you fix the coefficients. But of course, you also have to respect the symmetries because this is a Majorana spinner. Uh, you cannot have, it has to be either a gamma matrix with two indices or six indices, but you could not have anything with four indices in between. This would vanish by the Majorana property. So this is about everything you can write down in terms of bosons, coupling the bosons to the fermions. That's nothing else. And then, of course, there are these famous or infamous quadratic, uh, quartic terms that uh, people usually gloss over in, in such uh, discussions, and, uh, but they're there. Uh, I will also gloss over Do them. The quartic terms always work? Pardon? Is it here in the, is it the, quart is it here in the quartic terms always work? Uh, it's, it's uh, how should I say, it's, it's not a rigorous theorem, but it's a fact of life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, yes, but you know, now, so, so this is it, and um, now the next thing is, of course, I have to check the supersymmetry, um, and in checking the supersymmetry of this, of course, I'm not going to give this calculation here, because it would occupy more than the rest of my remaining time, and very likely, I've made through this experience many times, if you do this on the blackboard, you always make mistakes. And then you, you uh, get stuck. And so I will just, just say a few uh, interesting features. But if, if you want to check this, there's at some point, once in your life, you have to go to this uh, calculation. Um, so here are the variations. I wrote them. Now, as I said, some of this uh, was obvious from uh, it's again obvious from the kind of argument, what else could it be? Uh, for example, the variation of the field bind that you'd simply lift up from what you know from four dimensions. Uh, then there's the three form. And again, you have to pay attention to what, whether these are flat or curved indices. It just so happens to be like this. And uh, finally, there's the variation of the uh, of the gravitino. So here we have this derivative. That's just what I uh, mentioned yesterday, the gravitino being the gauge field of local supersymmetry. We certainly have to have this term here because this sort of simply covariantizes the variation of the old uh, Rita Schwinger action. But in addition, we also have this kind of funny extra structure here, which appears here. Again, uh, one has to pay little attention. Um, you cannot write down just everything, but it has to be, of course, compatible with general covariance and so on, Lorentz and so on. But you also have to make sure that if this is a Majorana spinner, that what you multiply it with must be such that what comes out is again a Majorana spinner. So that gives another constraint. Uh, already here, I might remark, because this will become I, I will come back to this point. You see what you he see here is a kind of, I mean, this, this we know is the Lorentz covariant derivative. But is there any way to interpret this extra thing also in this way? And uh, indeed, there is, as I will show. Uh, you can, so part of understanding the hidden symmetries of supergravity also has to do with the fact or with the question, can I somehow lump this, what's here, together with the spin connection. So here there's the Lorentz invariant to make it somehow a bigger, uh, it somehow enlarged the Lorentz group to something bigger. So this is something I will come back to. So uh, as I said, I will not, I will not uh, give you the complete derivation of the supersymmetry of this. Let me just give you some, uh, um, 
a little flavor of how the argument goes. Um, th the first question is, of course, uh, and this was, this was what confused, uh, well, was a lot of confusion in the early days of supergravity. Uh, what should you put here? Should you assume the omega to be the function of E, which I showed you yesterday, or should you uh, keep it as an independent field, as you would do in the, uh, in the Palatini, Palatini like formalism. So this is, uh, so this is what one, this is called second order formalism. Formalism would be to take omega to be the explicit function which I gave you yesterday, uh, explicit expression in terms of E. And uh, if you do this, you can imagine that this being a rather complicated expression, that what you're going to get is a big mess. And this is what when uh, Ferrara, Friedman, Van Nievenhuysen first tried to construct the theory, this is what they were uh, trying to do. And they made life uh, very, very, very complicated for them. And it took a Peter van Nievenhuysen really to push this to the very end. So that's one way to do it. And then there's something called first order formalism, which is keep omega independent. And then I have to give a formula, would also have to give a formula for this. Um, but uh, this was actually, this was done, this was uh, uh, Ferrara, Friedman, Van Nievenhuysen. Shortly after, there was a paper by Desa and Sumino, and they gave it in this form. And this was first order formalism. But now, by now, people are more clever than this. And they invented something called 1.5 order formalism. And this means that you somehow use this, but without actually writing it out. And, uh, and the idea is that if you have delta s, so use the equation of motion for this, with the action being the integral over the Lagrangian. Um, and this is something I didn't show, because there's another thing I would show in a full course in supergravity. I would show you that if you take this as an independent field and vary the action with respect to E, then you get exactly the same formula which I showed you yesterday. But Herman, you are getting different results in this case? Of no, 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 no. It's, no, no. It's, it's, it's always the same. It's just that, you know, the way these quartic terms will appear, they will appear in a different guise. Either you keep it independent, and then when you, uh, you substitute this equation you solve and then you substitute then you get extra terms and it was found that uh, actually in in Desa and Sumino one of the things they observed that with this they didn't have to write out the quartic terms ex explicitly they simply were produced by solving this equation because then there's also torsion and substituting back. But can you generalize this section 18 high order invariance in curvature? Oh that we come let, let, let's not comment on this at the moment. Be this will no, because for this section, I, okay, all formalism gives the same result. But if you would have high order curvature invariance, then uh, the result could be very different. Depending that's on the uh, that's a very good point. Um, and this has to do with the question whether you can have an off-shell or on-shell formalism. And a big problem, I mean, in any course one, we know how to do off-shell formalism, superfields, and so on. And you can also easily write uh, higher order invariance because in the offshore formalism, the transformations don't change as you keep adding these terms. This is not the case with on-shell because as you check the supersymmetry algebra here, you, you can show, actually already for simpler models, that the algebra on the fermions only closes properly upon use of the fermionic field equations. And this means that if you modify this, then you will also have to modify these transformation rules. And so you that you cannot modify the thing with the top of trivial transformation to make it completely off shell, 
no, no, there's no, I mean, in 35 years, people have tried to take this offshore and it just doesn't seem to work. There's no offshore formalism. This is, this is, uh, Not good for eh? No, no, it's okay. <laughs> there's nothing to do, but you know, the texture is the same story we have for locally supersymmetric particle where also you have to use yes. a thermionic equation of motion. Yes, right. But adding what people call uh, trivial transformation proportional to the equation of motion in a certain combination, you can make it completely offshore. No, here not no not so here. No, no, no. It's it's it, this is, is you know this is this was one of the big problems, and this is what people spend a lot of time on in the early days. Well, for n equals one, it was solved, but then they tried to find offshore formulations for higher n. It becomes more and more difficult, and finally, there is nothing for the maximum. The shell means that only thermionic equation should be satisfied. Yes, but uh, by supersymmetry, so everything half, is. Half of shell, yeah, because, uh, no, no, no. I mean, for what I'm going to tell you later, yeah. we'll just put the theory on shell. Period. So anyway, to come back to this, what this means is that uh, from this, you know, you, you conclude that ds, uh, well, delta omega s is equal to delta s by the omega times the variation. This is this simply vanishes if you put uh, um, if you secretly use without ex explicitly using <coughs> use this equation. So this is. Uh, as Peter van Nievenhuizen uh, used to say, he said, uh, this looks almost trivial, right? He said, either it's obvious or you will never understand it. So anyway, so this saves a lot of labor. So we don't have to worry about, we don't have to worry about all these funny variations here. So let me just tell you how, just give you a flavor it, uh, how, to, how to do this variation. By this 1.5 order formalism, I don't have to vary this thing. I just vary this. And this just gives the Einstein. Um, so let's just look at the variation of E. OK. So then I have to use uh, simple formulas like, so this is the basic formula. Uh, from this formula, I can derive the inverse. Or just the usual trick. You get a minus sign because it's the inverse. And the only thing that changes is now that this world index is put on the gamma matrix and the uh, A. And so this is to turn to the curved index. This becomes a flat index. And you can also calculate the variation of the E minus 1 using well-known formulas. Uh, sorry, E. So this is E epsilon gamma A psi A. And you always keep in mind if I write such an index that has a field bind hidden in it because the basic field is psi M with, uh, with the world index. OK, and then you can easily check that here you just have to vary these three terms. And uh, so that gives simply, uh, so let me call this 1 and 2. Let me call this term 1 and this term 2. So we'll just see, uh, look at particular terms. So we look at the variation of uh, 1. And now it's easy to, using these formulas, it's easy that you just get the Einstein, to see that you just get the Einstein tensor. It's 1 quarter times um, I epsilon gamma m psi n. Well, always keep in mind which here you raise it with the metric. Here you turn this curved with by means of the field bind. Um, this is GMN R minus 2 RMN times here this variation. So this is this is the variation of the of the first term. Now variation of the second term to cancel this, I just pick this term in the variation. This, I ignore this for the moment. And then I see that the delta of 2, uh, so what is it? It is equal to, well, I get the dm on this, and I get it on this. So here I integrate by parts to put it here. 
And because it's anti-symmetric, it just reduces to a commutator of two covariant derivatives. So I get minus i over 2 e. Uh, I forgot the e. Well, let me. So it's psi bar m, gamma m, n p. And now it's just a commutator acting on epsilon. So I've integrated by parts, as I said. Now the formula which I showed yesterday for the for the variation of uh, or for the commutator of two Lorentz covariant derivatives. So this is equal to uh, minus i over two. Well, this is one quarter times the curvature tensor. So this is uh, one i over eight r n p n p a b a b. And then I have psi m, gamma m, n p, gamma a b, a b acting on epsilon. Okay. So now I have to use a little bit of trickery with the gamma matrices because this is a product of gamma matrices, and I want to expand it on the basis of just simple <laughs> gamma matrices. So this is equal to this is equal to gamma. M and P fully ant anti symmetrized. Then I can get a delta symbol by contracting two, and I get one, two, three times two, six terms of this sort. So this is uh, E A M, uh, uh, sorry, E P, well, it doesn't matter, gamma M N B, anti symmetric, and this also made anti symmetric. And finally, I get two um, with a minus sign, delta A, oh, sorry, E A, M, E B, N, uh, gamma P, anti symmetrized, well, it's automatic. So you substitute into this, and then you will see that, first of all, this, this will not give anything because this is R of omega. And as I said, using this, now secretly using this information, this thing satisfies the usual Bianchi identity. It gives zero. So zero by Bianchi. Uh, here it's the same. Uh, this will also give zero. Either by the Bianchi, or there's one term where the gamma mn contracts into rmn. And then it's because the Ricci tensor is symmetric, and you contract it with something anti-symmetric, so also gives zero. So finally, this thing, so it's just the last term which gives a contribution. And uh, so this is equal to uh, 3 i over 4. It's of six terms, times divided by 8. Uh, psi m, uh, let me see, gamma m. We just write it like this, epsilon. And then here we have um, RNP, <coughs> NP, and made anti-symmetric. And then you see, if the M sits here, this is fully contracted. That's the Ricci scalar. If well, either N or P sits here, then it's only contracted <coughs> once. It gives twice the, um, the Ricci. So this is equal to. Uh, I over 4, um, epsilon gamma n, uh, or m, doesn't matter, um, 2 r m n minus g m n r. And here I've used another trick, <coughs> because these are my Rana spinners. This is psi bar epsilon. And I can convert it to epsilon psi bar, get a minus sign because of the Majorana property. I have to have it in the same order as here. And then now you see that it precisely cancels. So that's one, uh, one of the variations. And yes? No, no, we secretly, as I said, secretly uh, we assume that it's the omega it's just a question whether you say omega is independent or whether omega is a function of e. And 
really means that you say that omega is a function of e, but without ever writing out omega explicitly as a function of e. Otherwise, the form of the linear graph is very similar. Yes. So, um, okay. So the remaining uh, remaining terms you have to check in a similar. So you vary the. Uh, uh, you know, there are all kinds of variations. You have to be very careful. If you do this for the first time, yes? I guess you could also use it in other contexts, I, I think. Uh, anyway, so this is, this is as much as I want to tell you about this because uh, these calculations are rather tedious, and you have to be careful. And if you do it for the first time, you're probably uh, busy for some time. Uh, actually, you know, in the first paper, it took them like two papers to get this right, and even a computer, because they were explicitly using this explicit expression. And this is when Deza and Sumino came out. They had some kind of, um, how should I say, not very complimentary remarks about Ferrara, Friedman, and Nievenhuisen having to go into sextic or quintic fermionic terms. Well, this is much easier, but later on people realize that this is, this is the good way to do it. If you don't have an off-shell formalism. But uh, you need it to do it anyway, in three ways, because there is no reason to expect that you will get the same equation of motion. No, no, they're always, always physically equivalent. It's, it's no, but for Slava, this is, I, it's Slava, I'm not saying that this is a very important question you're raising, but, you know, in this case, it's much harder to, to, to answer it than in the case when you have an offshore formalism. No, no, I, I just meant a very simple thing. If you take high derivative gravity, then uh, Palatini and uh, uh, G give completely different equation, as you know. Yes, yes. You see, in one case, you are getting Yes, 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 yes. I, I know this, yes. But, yeah, but let, let's not... Uh, yeah, but it's important thing. Let's... Yes, it's... Yes, it's yes. <laughs> and what you said about people writing papers about what uh, for the trash can, yeah, uh, there's also a lot of, you know... No, in principle, you are getting... Uh, when you're making... Yeah, okay. Maybe let's, let's, let's not, uh, let's, let's get, get to more important things. Because uh, uh, this is not to deny what you're raising is a very important, extremely important problem. And certainly for early cosmology, there's no question about it. It's just that uh, I don't think we have really good answers. Now, let me just say. Yes. Uh, so, so you know, for example, you just add R plus 4, there's only one possibility, and you can add R plus 4, you can just take R plus 4. Let's, let's, let, let's uh, postpone this question to... Uh, um, uh, there's one more thing which I wanted to say, which is going to be important for uh, later. So this, this we, I guess, let me see. Let me... Um, uh, a d d so where did I hide the? Yes, it's there. there. Oh, sorry. Okay. So now, as I said, and it was the previous lecture, I already mentioned going to dual fields. So uh, you can also uh, now on shell only define the dual a dual six form field. And the way you do this, and let me just use, uh, because otherwise I'll just lose too much time writing out indices. Um, um, let me just use form language again. Um, uh, um, why did I have this? Sorry. Well, anyway, uh, what, what you do what you do is when you write the equation of motion for this field, then, uh, well, as I said in my previous lecture, so there's the Bianchi identity, which is df4 equal to 0. And there's the equation of motion, 
which you can write as divergence f4. But, but now you have this, uh, because of this funny term here, you will get an extra contribution here, plus uh, f4, um, um, f4 plus fermions equal to zero. So we could write it out in derivative. So when you take, when you do the equations of motion, then of course the, the bare A field becomes uh, replaced by FF. You just have to be a little careful about the factors as you vary here. Uh, but anyway, the, question, the equation you get is that uh, D, the divergence of F, F4 is an um, epsilon times F4, F4. Divergence has three indices. So this epsilon 11 minus 8 is also 3. So the only thing in, in order to turn this into a, into a divergence equation, you have to take out the d from here. So you write this as d a3, a3. And then you can take out the d because of the Bianchi. So you can write again write the equation of motion for the three-form field, even with this modification as a divergence. And once you have written something in the divergence, you can dualize and it becomes a curl for the, for the, uh, um, the dual field. So what, what, so what we now have is we have the, the bosonic sector, we have the EMA with the A, M, N, P, and we have our six-form field, A, M1 to M6. And I told you that... Uh, these things can coexist peacefully on the mass shell at the level of the equations of motion, not off shell. Uh, in fact, uh, shortly after Kremer, uh, Julia, and Scherk, uh, actually, we had a paper with Peter van Nievenhuis and Paul Townsend where we tried to reformulate the theory using the six form field. But at this action, on Lagrangian level, it's not possibly possible because with the six form field, you cannot write anything of this type. So we forget about this. We just con consider the on-shell theory, the equations of motion. And at the level of the equations of motion, everything is fine. You can even write the variation of this field. You can work it out uh, by using, uh, for this, you have to actually have to use the rarita schwinger equation. Uh, and then you find that this is equal to 3i epsilon bar gamma m1 to m5. Uh, psi m6, okay, so this is, what else could it be? It comes from here, it's just the analog of this. However, because of this, this funny term, you get an extra contribution, which is like 5i, well actually this is something you should, th this is the kind of thing you should never trust when you see. This is the kind of thing you always, if you really need it, you have to check it for yourself. No, no way. So here's a kind of nonlinear term, m1, m2, psi m3, a, m4, m5, m6. So you see that it works on shell, but in order to uh, make this work, you have to use both fields simultaneously in the supersymmetry variations. So here we now have an 11 dimensions, a hierarchy, and now final thing, which I also mentioned yesterday, uh, is if you now try to dualize gravity, there's something called, which we call, refer to as the dual graviton, M8. There's 11 minus three indices, okay? Um, and well, this is this is first time in this game that there appears a non-trivial Young tableau field representation with uh, like looks like this, okay, eight boxes, eight, okay, so, but, but dualizing this, that it becomes progressively more difficult. Going from here to here, I have to stay on shell or to even define it, but up to this level and going on shell, everything works at the full nonlinear level with a full coupling to gravity, everything is fine. This thing, this thing only works at the linearized level, as I told you. 
So uh, the, 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 reason, the reason I'm uh, nevertheless, uh, nevertheless emphasizing this, nobody, nobody has been able to write down uh, nonlinear equations of motion or variations or whatever for this, for this thing. There are all kinds of difficulties. Uh, it's just when you take the linearized Einstein equations and you try to turn them into dual pair, like when you say F4 is the dual of this, then Bianchi for one field applies equation of motion for the other. Uh, at the level of the linearized Einstein equations, you can do a similar thing uh, by having first order equations, where you have the metric fluctuation here, and then this dual thing. And then again, it's such that if you take them together and post this duality, then uh, the linear Einstein equations guarantee that the existence of this field. Now the difficulty is we don't know how to make it nonlinear. We don't even know how to couple matter. Keeping, keeping gravity linear but putting a source, even then it doesn't work. And in fact, there are uh, uh, no-go theorems by the Belgians. Uh, Baker, Boulanger, Henault has in particular written about this. And they actually have no go theorem saying that you cannot deform this to a nonlinear theory, but it's a no go theorem, so you have certain assumptions. And one of the assumptions is that you insist on Lorentz invariance in the linearized theory. If you put all this in, you cannot make it uh, work at the nonlinear level. So they've de actually developed a kind of gauge theory for non trivial Young tableau fields. And that theory is such that just like for the standard fields which we know, that if you impose the gauge conditions, then uh, the representations are simply given by replacing GLD by SOD minus 2, just like for the vector, the P form, and the other fields. Now, as I said, this is, this is we see here the duality symmetries that we're going to uncover now uh, are such that they somehow seem to require this field. So there's a clash between, or you will see emerge, a clash between duality symmetry and space-time covariance. And one way, uh, the problem of dualizing gravity, which is an unsolved problem, let me repeat, could be resolved is by dropping some of the assumptions in the logo theorem. And this is, this is actually where we find indications for. You have to give up somehow space-time covariance if you want to make the full duality symmetry of the theory manifest. Okay, so at this point now, I want to pass on because the reason, the reason uh, this theory was originally constructed was not because people were interested in 11 dimensions, but they wanted to construct n equals 8 supergravity in four dimensions. However, that theory, as I will explain, is highly nonlinear. And uh, when you, you know, you can try the Noether procedure, which is a standard tool, but that will not work with non-polynomial theories. And therefore, they thought that um, first by constructing this theory, they have a full theory, and let's, let's now reduce it to four dimensions, and we have n equals 8 supergravity in four dimensions. So, and the big surprise there was that as they descend, it turns out that there's more symmetry than you expect. And this came under the name of hidden symmetries. And finally, it was only the realization that there are such hidden symmetries that made possible the construction of the full nonlinear Lagrangian. So let me first of all now tell, tell you a little, little bit about kinematic evidence or hidden exceptional symmetries. This at the time came as a total surprise. Nowadays everybody talks about E7 and E8 and whatever, but at that time it was a total surprise. It's really one of the great discoveries in our subject. So, as I said, they had constructed a theory with the intent of doing four-dimensional supergravity. So idea was to reduce, uh, reduce on, on T7, which simply means you split the coordinates into 4 plus 7, and you drop the dependence on the 7 
internal coordinates. Okay. By the way, when I see kinematic, it's just like yesterday when I said when you put together to build a supersymmetric sphere, you have to make boson and fermion degrees match, but that's not good enough. I mean, of course, that's just the beginning. It's just a necessary condition. And here will be the same, just to tell you how the counting works. And uh, Numer it's numerology to start with, but then you have to fill in the details, and that's why the Cremier Julia paper is, uh, I don't know, 70 pages long. It, it, you will see if you will only appreciate this if you really look at this paper. Okay, so what we do, so we drop the dependence, and then we also have to split the indices as into four and seven dimensional indices. And this is my notational convention. Mu, nu, etc., are indices in four dimensions. M, N, P, and so on are internal seven dimensional indices. So let's just see how this works. And let's take, you know, remember these are the fields that we have. Okay, so GMN. So this is 11 dimensional metric. If I split it according to this uh, split, then I get either all indices, internal, or uh, one index, space time, or both indices, space time. Uh, Okay, well, that's just a four-dimensional metric. It's clear. These are, because this runs from 1 to 7, these are just the Kaluza-Klein vectors, roughly speaking. So there are seven of them. Let me just make a little more room for this. Uh, this is uh, symmetric. So symmetric in two indices. There are seven indices, so that's 28 degrees of freedom. Okay. Uh, then we have A, M, N, P. Uh, so here we have A, M, N, P. That's anti-symmetric with M, N, P ranging over seven values, so that's 35. Um, then we have A, mu, M, N. That's 21. And we have A, mu, nu, M, seven. And finally we have A, mu, nu, M U nu rho, M U nu rho, all indices in four dimensions, so it's just one. Okay? So, uh, then, uh, of course, it was known, and I will uh, repeat this, maybe not today. Uh, it was known that N equals 8 supergravity has 28 vectors. So here they are, 7 plus 21 is 28. There was... Uh, Scalars, there's 70 scalars. So there's 28 from here, 35 from here. And then you remember that in four dimensions, two form is equivalent to scalar field, provided it appears with this gauge invariant interaction. So this plus this plus this makes 70. And that's the first numerical coincidence because 70, and this actually. Uh, I think this had to, well, Bernard, Julia somehow had the carton oeuvre complete uh, under his pillow, I think. And at the time, he was the only one who seemed to know this. It's 133 minus 63. And this is just the dimension of the coset E7. Well, I'll tell you what the 7, 7 means. SU8. Okay. So that was the first, when they first got the idea that this, this, there's a hidden E7. But of course, what you had to do, you said in the Lagrangian to dualize this, and then you get a horribly complicated uh, expression. Uh, and of course, their paper, partly. Sorry. No announcement? Like <laughs> or, or, or cut off or anything? No, no, no. OK. <laughs> okay. Yes? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll show you how this goes. It's very, now it's very easy. But I'll, I'll show you it in a more modern way of doing things. And for this, I refer to the paper which I've written last year with uh, Godaska Twins, uh, which is actually there are two papers. 
So uh, the modern, more modern way to do this is, is here, and there are more. Uh, because in order to make this structure more apparent, it's better, rather than going to four dimensions, dualize, and then get a complete mass, we start, we start from these fields. We keep in mind that there are also these fields. So let's do this here, A, M1 to M6. So we have A, M, N, P, Q, R, S, 7. We have A, U, M, N, P, Q, R. Uh, that's 21. We have A, Mu, M, N, P, Q. Uh, that's uh, 35. And then we also have A, Mu, Nu, Rho, M, N, P, 21. Uh, sorry, 35. And there's one with four indices. And then we also have the dual graviton. You see the dual graviton also comes into this counting because, uh, um, and you will see in a moment why. It's M8N. Now this is anti-symmetric in eight indices, but we only have seven available, so this is not there. So then there's H mu M1 to M7. N anti-symmetric, so it's an epsilon, so it's seven. And then we have H mu nu, M1 to M6. N, that's 49. And we also get the dual graviton if you take the symmetric part in mu and nu. Here it's the anti-symmetric part, and so on. That's also OK. So uh, what you now see is that uh, let's see. I, I, I will use different colors now just to make this clear how this works. Rather than dualizing in four dimensions, we dualize in 11 dimensions. And we get directly, the structure becomes much more uh, apparent. So here we have the scalar degrees of freedom. So it's again 70. And the difference is now that we've dualized in 11, not in four dimensions. Uh, here, what do we get here? So this is... 7 plus 5, 7, 21, 7, 21 plus 7. So that makes 56. 56 is equal to, well, 7 plus 21 plus 21 plus 7. And, uh, well, it was known, of course, and recognized by Grimmel Julia that there's no 28 dimensional representation of E7. It's the slowest dimensional as one is 56. And here you see the 56. And you now also realize this is electromagnetic duality. Because here we have the 28 vector potentials, electric, the ones that appear in the Lagrangian. But here you have the dual magnetic. magnetic. And as I will show in my next lecture, is that you can formulate the field equations for the spin one in four dimensions, not by doing second order field equation for the 28, but have first order field equations for the electric and dual magnetic uh, vector potentials. Okay, so you see immediately from this form that this works. Um, uh, so this is, of course, every you must have heard about this in context of electric magnetic duality. Uh, so the E7 somehow rotates also electric into magnetic. So it's definitely duality invariance. So we have this. Well, already at the time when I mean, only this was known, uh, we were you know you wonder what what is this because the three form in four dimensions it's not just nothing. It's not a propagating field, but it's worth a cosmological constant. So it's like uh, you know a one parameter deformation of the Lagrangian, but that looks to be incompatible with E7. Uh, so the question for a long time was how does this fit into the picture? Now the thing is, and this is this is now goes beyond Cremer Julliard, is that uh, I now can first of all also keep these these forms. And I realize, maybe two, 
it turns out that uh, these build up in four dimensions to 133 representations of uh, E7. Uh, 7 plus 35 plus 49 plus. Well, you know, you see that you somehow seem to need extra stuff that's not there in 11 dimensions. And this is what I will get to in my last lecture, where this extra stuff could originate from. And finally, this thing, uh, which is, uh, seemed like uh, would spoil E7 invariance, we now know that this has to do with the deformations of the 11-dimensional uh, theory. And in this case, it turns out that, so it's 1 plus 35 plus a lot of extra stuff, and it builds up into 912 representation of E7. Now, at this point, it's numerology. I have no argument. But with a modern way of doing gauge supergravity, we now understand that this thing also appears, appears and it plays the role. It sort of parameterizes the deformations of the maximal supergravity in four dimensions that go under the name of gauge supergravity. So let me just tell you how this works for, so this was for uh, 11 equals 4 plus 7. And just to show you how this works for 3 plus 8, to give the E8 invariance. So I do this in red. So in this case, we get, uh, um, so again, just numerology, but it takes a lot of work to actually work out the Lagrange and see that this, these symmetries are realized. So if, you do, if this runs over 8 values, I get 36. Uh, this is uh, 56. Um, and the old way of doing things, uh, I would also get uh, in three dimensions, a scalar is dual to a vector. So I also have to count this as a vector. So it's 8. And here I have uh, 28. So this, this now, let me see where I can write this. Um, so let's just add up these numbers. So it's 8, 28, 8 plus, oh no, 36, 36 plus 56 plus, 20, plus 8 plus 28. And when you add it up, it's 128, which is the dimension of E8, 8 over SO16. That's the hidden symmetry in in three dimensions. And again, there's a modern way of doing this, which is, uh, which you go this way. And the interesting thing is here, this is why three dimensions begin to be more difficult. E8 is, you know, if you think you understand E7, E8 is even more subtle. It's the real Rolls Royce among the finite dimensional Lie groups. So here, because you can have an epsilon, in eight indices, so this gives eight. Um, and with the vectors, you can also keep going. And then it turns out that in addition to this coset, it turns out that the vectors, vector fields in three dimensions, <coughs> belong to uh, a 248 of uh, E8. And the two form fields. Well, that, that now becomes even more magical in a way because, as you see, I will need even more stuff. There. Then it turns out that this becomes a 3,875 of E8. In fact, you can also do it for the three forms, and then you get something like 148,000 uh, uh, representation of E8. Now, at this point, it's numerology. But I, I hope to be able to tell you a little about the gauge supergravities where we now understand precisely what the significance of these extra fields is. And this, is, this is leads to what we now call the tensor hierarchy. Um, so, and just to repeat, in the old way of doing things, you would dualize in four or three dimensions. 
And then after a lot of work, you would recognize the symmetry structure. In this more modern way of doing things, you do things in 11 dimensions, and you can more or less read off. But it's plainly apparent from this kind of analysis that duality will not stop here. It's, it's, this is tensor hierarchy. So this can be made evident in four and three dimensions by deforming these maximal supergravities. But uh, once you try to embed it into higher dimensions, try to understand the higher dimensional origin of this, it's very clear that you have to go beyond. So the one particle states in unformed representation of hidden symmetry, as far as I understand. The one particle states in unformed representations of hidden symmetry. No. So there is some way to recognize hidden symmetry in terms of the linear level. elements. Well, the linear, yes, that at the linear level, because what people do when they look at, say, four-point amplitudes, I mean, this is like when you have the Goldstone phenomenon. It's spontaneously broken, and then the the scalar fields can be thought of as kind of Goldstone bosons. And this means that the original Lagrangian, not the deformed ones, the original ones will be invariant under constant shifts of these scalar fields. This is general feature of Goldstone uh, fields in quantum field theory. Um, so you can, and it also means that you will only have derivative couplings with these. There will be no potential. Um, so what you can check at the linearized level is that an amplitudes are invariant under such shifts. And this connects to old stuff with low energy theorems and pion physics and nonlinear realized symmetries and so on. <coughs> but you must understand that this, these symmetries act in a highly nonlinear way on the fields. And if you try to implement the full, this full symmetry on the on the correlator, you would relate, you know, arbitrary endpoint functions to one another. Um, so, um, you know, no one has been able to make this fully explicit in the quantum fields. I, I will say a little more about this in my lecture tomorrow. So, anyway, so this this. Oh, six gives. Oh, oh no, that uh, it all works beautifully. If you do it, uh, I didn't do it because uh, you can also do 11, 11 plus 11 is 4 plus 6. Then you find E6. If you do 6 plus 5, E5. But if you look at the Dinkin diagram, E5 is just uh, is SO5, 5. And E4 is SL5. So if you just look at the Dinkin diagram, you can think of these as being, uh, um, well, shortened exceptional Lie algebras. Or you can think of the, of the exceptional Lie algebras or groups being prolongations of, of, these, uh, of these groups. Uh, well, so far for the kinematic evidence, well, I think it's a good point to stop because uh, T t t tomorrow I will tell you how to use that information to actually construct the theory. That's, that's uh, at this point it's just a numerology, and, uh, but the hard work is now in actually showing that you know, the theory actually does have this symmetry. Yeah, well, we will say more about E9 and E10 towards the end of my lecture. Okay. So well, you want fifteen